a week from this Monday, September 4th, which, like I said, is a week from this Monday, will mark a decade, that's right, a decade since what is considered the reboot, soft reboot of Archie Sonic officially began. That's right. It will be a week from this Monday, September 4th, Labor Day weekend. It will mark a whole decade since this reboot, soft reboot, uh, became official. And I'll tell you guys, it is, you know, I, I've talked about this before months ago, but it's still hard to believe that this reboot happened, you know, in the way that it did. I mean, in case you guys don't know, and I'm sure Jacob Berkeley, uh, the Satayam historian, may go over this uh, in his documentary he's got planned for September 18th, as well as in the book that he's hoping to get out maybe around next year, if not later, if not sooner, who knows. But in case you guys don't know, and a lot of people have talked about this, a lot of people have gone over this, and I'm sure Cyberpunk Jordan's going to go over it as well, uh, among others. But in case you guys don't know, the way this came about all began because behind the scenes, Ken Penders basically took Archie Comics to court. He took him to court over royalties that he felt he was owed. And believe it or not, this also all stemmed, the root of this, if you will, all stemmed from when basically people from BioWare, BioWare, you know, basically went and talked to his family at one of the comic book conventions he was at. And it was through this meeting, apparently, that basically... The idea for Sonic Chronicles, the video game, which I have a copy of, thanks to Frank Hill, it's Frank. Basically, this is where the whole, I guess you can say, foundation for that game came to be. Because in the game, you have this you know, group of echidnas known as the Dark Brotherhood, led by a female kidna named Shade. And because you had these characters, this got the attention of Ken Penders, who basically went, you know, went, I guess you could say, I wouldn't, well, I, would, I guess you wouldn't say berserk, but basically went off the deep end. And some would say rightfully so. Because the Dark Brotherhood and Shade bared a very identical, detail to detail almost, resemblance to the Dark Legion. To the Dark Legion in Archie Comics, in the Archie Sonic Comics. And Shade bared, personality wise, not design wise, but personality wise and background wise, Shade shared some of those elements with a certain pink echidna who was now Knuckles' soulmate, his love interest, his wife, if you will, his girlfriend, Julie Sue. So because of all that, Ken Penders decided to go and sue BioWare for what they did. And then on top of that, at the encouragement, I think, of his wife or someone, he went and sued Archie Comics for royalties. Now, I don't think he won the Bioware case. I don't know what happened there. He may have won, may have not won. I'm not going to get much into detail. If you want to look that up, there's many videos and audios and, you know, um, essays, you know, here on the Internet, YouTube, podcasting, that go more into detail about it. But basically, because of that, because of that, and the fact that Ken Penders felt he wasn't getting recognition, acknowledgement, you know, financial uh, return for the usage of his characters, he decided to sue Archie Comics a little afterwards. 
And because he decided to sue Archie Comics a little afterwards, that was a whole mess that really just caused the entire book behind the scenes to go through a downward spiral that it never could recover from, or even had a chance to recover from. And you know why? You know why? Because apparently Archie Comics could not find any documentation, physical paper documentation on file that basically stated Ken Penders had written, written in, a, in agreement that all characters he would create for the book would belong to Archie and mostly to Sega. But because Archie did not have that documentation, you know, physically on hand, but, pho pho but photogenically did, they photogenically did, there was nothing they could really do. Thus, in the middle of the Mecca Sally arc, thus in the middle of it, and when I'm talking the middle, I'm talking basically right smack dab, you know, 50% done with, and 50% to go, if not less. Right smack in the dab of it, when they began the sub-arc known as Endangered Species, that is when all the BS began. That's right. That's when all the BS began. And you know what? And you know what? You want to know how bad it got as we were getting into Endangered Species? One of the issues that came before it, one of the issues that came before it originally described Sonic's team of him, Tails, and Amy running into somebody and teaming up with somebody they thought had died. Someone that was undercover as part of the Dark Legion, um, I guess you could say, uh, group, if you will, the Dark Legion uh, assembly, if you will, for that area. Were, the description originally described them running into somebody they thought was dead, but was actually undercover as part of the Dark Legion. And who was that supposed to be? Hershey the Cat. It was supposed to be Hershey the Cat, and she was going to team up with them. But because of the legality, the behind-the-scenes BS that was going on, they couldn't do that. They could not do that, so... What happened instead? What happened instead? They decided to take Hershey out of the equation and make the character into two, and it ended up being Lita and Lyco, it's L-Y-C-Co, Lyco, as the ones following them, you know, instead of Hershey. And Lita, that's L-E-E-T-A, Lita and Lyco are part of Lupe's wolf pack Freedom Fighters. And because they ended up joining them, this got the attention of another character that made a return after a long absence, Harvey Hu, and he was able to recruit them into the secret Freedom Fighters along with Sally's brother Elias and Silver the Hedgehog. But, be that as it may, be that as it may, that wasn't the only change that had to happen because of this. The other change was an endangered species. And you could see this. You could see this specifically in the book itself. And there was even imagery. I don't know if it was provided by Tracy Yardlin or somebody on the book, but there is... But there is online imagery of some of the stuff that was taken out. And again, you could see the effects of what was taken out in the book. You could see the dialogue from a font perspective changed because of what was going on. And mostly, the original cover had a change to it as well. Because in the original cover for Endangered Species, where you see Sonic and Knuckles getting having to hold their ears as... Uh, this uh, Tasmanian devil character Thrash is using his power against them. At the bottom right hand corner of that cover, originally you had, you know, standing side by side in a cool po pose together, Amy Rose and Julie Sue. That's right, Amy Rose and Julie Sue. But because of what was going on behind the scenes,
That also got changed, and Julie Sue ended up being taken out, and all you got was Amy Rose posing basically back-to-back with nothing. With nothing. And again, this sub-arc, which was before the finale, if you will, the basically the final act, if you will, the Mecca Sally arc, this sub-arc was the biggest example of the behind-the-scenes BS that occurred. The biggest example. And what happened, what occurred, and I don't think Ian Flynn could hide this anymore despite what, you, what he wants to say. Let's be honest. With all due respect to the guy, I don't think he's going to hide it much longer. But what happened basically because of that, in my opinion, was a rushing, if you will, a rushing of the first Sonic and Mega Man crossover world's collide. That is what happened. That's what I believe happened. Because of the lawsuit, they had to rush, you know, they had to rush basically the crossover. Now, true, we got a decent crossover out of it, don't get me wrong, but they had to rush it probably into production a lot quicker than they were originally planning because of the BS going on here. But that's just my opinion, and maybe I'm wrong, and maybe that's how they planned it originally, but I seriously doubt it. I seriously doubt it. So because of that, any other original plans that Ian Flynn and his crew had to wrap up the Mecha Sally arc as it was, any original plans that they had, guess what? thrown out the window or they had to be changed. Yeah. They were either thrown out the window or they had to be changed. (laughs) I mean, because seriously, Ian Flynn bringing in the Krasud, something we had not seen since the beginning of the comic, to basically be like the key element that's going to restore Sally back to normal or help do so? That's like, that's like, what, it's like, wh- wh- why, why bring that, why bring that into the equation? You know, obviously you were aiming into another direction. You were going to go a different route, but suddenly you decide, oh, we're going to, we're going to bring the Krasud in. No, no, no. I, I don't think that was the original plan. And I've mentioned this before. I do not think that was the original plan. I think, honestly... I think, honestly, the original plan was something different, but because of the lawsuits involved, they had to switch things up. They had to switch things up, and that's the best they came up with. That's just my opinion. Again, I could be wrong, but that's just my opinion. My opinion. But after that, of course, we ended up getting the crossover, and then after the crossover, we ended up getting... Issue 252. And what happened with that issue? That issue was the beginning of the whole reboot, soft reboot of the comic, the characters, and the world. Everything changed. Everything changed. And how, how did Ian Flynn explain this change at the end of the crossover? He basically had Eggman's insanity once again get the best of him by interfering with Sonic trying to restore it. I mean, basically, from a story perspective, you could tell Sonic was trying to restore it to the possibly to the point point of when to the point that of before that Genesis wave was unleashed. Maybe even going further to. You know, the end or around issue 230 and preventing Sally from being roboticized. We don't know. We don't know what the, what the original intent would have been, but basically because Eggman in story could not accept the fact that he lost again, would not allow it to happen, and thus he caused caused in continuity things to change, change and some would say somewhat for the better in story and from a readership perspective fan perspective somewhat for, for the better and in story not really but yeah 
It's all because of these lawsuits that Ian Flint, not Ian Flint, but Ken Penders put onto the book, put on Archie, and Archie could not really, you know, physically, but only photogenically, could provide evidence of, hey, here it is, he did sign something. This is why it all happened. This is why, you know, a week from this Monday, on September 4th, which will be the anniversary, it will mark 10 years, a decade since the reboot began. And some could say that's when the comic really started to go downhill. That, now, not storyline-wise, because the stories were actually really good. In fact, I still consider the Sonic Universe four-parter Spark of Life one of the best they've done. No, no question. You know, no question. But, you know, may, but some would say financially, the comics were not the same anymore. You know, they were not the same because of what happened. So, basically, they just, you know, so basically, that's pretty much how, that's pretty much, you know, how people view the comics' demise happening. You know, like the stories were good. And the sales were decent, but not decent enough. Basically, the overall thing was the comic just did not recover, you know, from that behind-the-scenes lawsuit and stuff that occurred. That, that's basically how people view it. Like, yeah, the comics were good, sales were decent, but not, you know, at the level it used to be. And, you know, a lot of people feel this pretty much did it in. But here's what's interesting, though. You, you know, here's what's interesting, though. As we approach the decade, you know, as we approach this 10-year anniversary, more information throughout these past few years have come out. And what's interesting about that information is that there are reports that maybe Penders himself wasn't, wasn't, wasn't you know, entirely truthful. Yeah. There is speculation through these reports, numerous reports through numerous sites, that maybe Penders wasn't truthful in everything he said. Like maybe, maybe he doesn't own complete ownership of the characters he do, he did create. So there is there is rumor and speculation that you know going up to this ten year anniversary that maybe he wasn't telling the truth. You know he. He wasn't being completely honest with the courts or with the fans or with those in, in, at Archie Comics or Sega. You know, like he wasn't, he wasn't being honest with them, you know, to a point to where he could say, well, yeah, I did technically sign something, but, you know, they don't, if they don't have it, then, hey, I should claim ownership kind of deal, something like that. But, yeah. Yeah, that's what's been reported recently in the past few years that, you know, it's been, and people have said they've, they've and people have said Ed, that they have discovered this, they've even shared it online, that basically he wasn't being truthful. You know, that, that everything he wasn't, everything he said was true, maybe wasn't true. But we don't know. We don't know. So... You know, looking back on it now, 10 years later, there's a lot of people that, you know, when they, upon hearing that, they're like, really, Penders? So you basically could have essentially, you know, essentially, you know, prevented the book from dying if you would have just been truthful? You know, some people look back on it now 10 years later, or going on to the 10-year anniversary, like, you know, he did, like, this could have been prevented if he would have just said or acknowledged, yeah, I did sign something, but if they don't have it, you know, to prove that I did, and maybe even he says something like, well, I lost my copy too, you know, who, who knows what would have happened? Who knows? But, but yeah, it's just like, I think to quote Lynn Cara, who quoted <laughs> what the judge said in one of the hearings, uh, basically, it's a situation of, well, this is a fine mess you got in yourself, and this is a fine, you know, this is a fine mess you got yourself into. But as Linkara points out, it's not a fine mess; it's a ten-car pileup of a mess. 
because a fine mess would have been easily sipped through. This, you have to really get dig in and find whatever else is there kind of deal, you know? But yeah, but yeah, basically, basically, you know, some people look at this now and they're like, was Penders being honest or was he lying? Was he being honest or was he lying? You see, that's what they're curious about. That's what they're curious about. Like, is, was he being truly honest or was he lying about what he said? You know, because, again, looking back in this 10 years later, it's, it's just hard. It's just hard to fathom that, you know, this all started basically because, you know, let's be honest, even if he didn't win, it, win the case entirely, it all started because apparently BioWare wanted to be sneaky behind his back. So, I, I can't really say any more than what I've said before, but I will admit this, you know, the, like I've said before, the reboot did give us a good, decent story arc. It did get Sally back to normal, even though she had a new design, more game aesthetic design. But it did give us what I consider, and I said this in my tier list that I did yesterday, it gave us what I consider the best of the best when it comes to her. Because this Sally was a combination of all the good elements of her. And I liked that. I really did. So, you know, and, and it brought the Freedom Fighters back and all that. I really enjoyed it. I, re I really enjoyed it. And give credit where it's due, they did what they could to tie up loose ends. And if using Nicole as the predictable duex machina key to restore the memories was a way to do it, then, hey, all credit to them. But yeah, it's just hard to believe it's going to be 10 years, a week from this Monday, since this all began. And a lot of people, again, will look at it in a way like, you know, it shouldn't have happened. You know, shouldn't have happened, but it did. And people are going to look at it and they're going to say, you know, they're going to say that if Penders was lying, or they're going to say and think along the lines of Penders was lying, you know, then basically his lying you know, killed what could have been, you know, still a great book even to this day. But let me know what your guys' thoughts are. Comment down below, live chat during the premiere. What were your thoughts? Give me your thoughts in the live chat and in the comments. What were your thoughts when you first, you know, heard about the lawsuit, saw the effects it was happening, you know, as they were happening with the book, and how did you feel about the reboot when it occurred? And were you glad at least we got the characters back? Maybe pretty much the best, uh, pretty, with pretty much all the best elements of those characters combined into one, into, into one uh, character. Let me know down below in the comments as well as in the live chat during the premiere. Like the video. You will get an audio podcast version of this at BW Roses Discussions Podcast, which you can listen to at all your podcast affiliates except for Pandora. But more specifically, check it out at Spotify. It will help me out greatly. Also, check me out my Teespring store. Uh, my TP, Teespring store, I should say. Also, check me out at twitch.tv slash BW Roses. Vimo. You can find me at Vimo at BW Roses. And until next time, guys, I am out.